Open your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, we return to verses 26 to 38 in our reading, but we'll be focusing on verses 29 to 38 as we consider a virgin birth, part 2. We'll be reading, as I already said, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. If you would please stand for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the goodness of your word, that wondrous, ever sharp, two-edged sword that is able to pierce and divide with surgical precision. Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to return to your word, to bask in the gloriousness of it, Father, that we have been able to lift up praises, lift up worship, lift up our repentance and corporate confession of sin before you, Father. We thank you that we are able to be fed and edified by your word. And we thank you for the life and the health that you've bestowed upon us and the great privilege that you've bestowed upon us to be here before you. And most importantly, we thank you for the redemption we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, as we begin and continue, in a sense, this morning, our meditation on the events for telling the birth of our Lord and Savior, Father. We ask that you give us, by your Holy Spirit, a clarity to understand what we are to hear, that we have eyes that hear your word truly and ears that are able to see the written word clearly. And Father, a mind and a heart that is able, by your Holy Spirit, to engrave the truth of your word upon them that we may not sin against you. Father, may we also be of such a disposition that we are not able to simply stand idly by and warm a bench, but rather that we be doers of your word, that we act upon the truths of your word in everything that we think and do and say, Father, that we may glorify you in every possible way as much as we are able. We ask this in the name of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. We got to meditate on quite a bit last week. The obscurity of the town, the words of the angel to Zechariah and how they're going to contrast to the words to Mary, the reality of the virginity of this young woman 
and the importance of the lineage. We have to remember, as we have dialogued and conversed about this over the last several years, as we've meditated on it, Advent season after Advent season, that we are constrained and confined to within that which is clearly illuminated by the scriptures. The particular genetics of how it is that Jesus would be the son of David, the realities of the wondrous miracle described are not what are clearly elucidated in the scriptures. Not to such a degree that we can make a dogmatic statement in any other way than what is clearly revealed here. The fact that the Holy Spirit would come upon this virgin and overshadow her, that there would be a miraculous creation of something in a similar way to that of Genesis. But we do know, and what is clearly here, is a righteous, faithful woman of God who considers her betrothal as it should be. With the weightiness, as we talked last week, that marriage would hold. We spoke of that reality. We spoke of how, just how far detached from this truth modern society is. Just how it is that betrothal is not seen the same way now. How far Christians of all people, how far those that hold the name of God's elect have moved away from holding the marriage bed as undefiled. For all intents and purposes, Mary and Joseph were basically wed. And yet there is a sanctity that is absolutely lacking in modernity. The modern mind would say, well, if we're for all intents and purposes married, then why not reap the benefits of marriage? That was not the case. They would abstain from consummating the marriage until after the marriage ceremony. And we'll see how that mentality and how it is that thinking about marriage biblically, thinking about betrothal biblically, thinking about these things, and as we touched on last week a little bit, how it is that these are types and shadows of our relationship communally as the church, as the bride of Christ, awaiting the consummation and the marriage feast. Think of that. We must remain faithful. We must not be an adulterous generation. We must remain in that faithfulness until the consummation. Until, as the King James Version says, until the bridegroom cometh. When the Lord descends, it is to find a people who are virtuously waiting in faithfulness. We left off last week with the greeting of Gabriel to Mary. Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. And we got to meditate a little bit on how peculiar a greeting it must have been and how startling. Startling because God had not spoken to His people in 400 years. Startling because Gabriel calls this young woman favored one and one whom the Lord is with. And all of these factors in and of themselves are more than enough to confound just about anyone. Especially when presented by a celestial being who abides in the presence of God. 
We, we have to factor all of these truths in. This hasn't happened in 400 years. And the very first words that she hears from this angel are, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And any righteous young woman would have thought, Wait, what? why me? What's going on? What's happening? I, I appreciate the way that Dr. Sproul commented on this. He said, those who are of a Roman Catholic background may notice immediately the familiarity of these words as they're part of the rosary. The words are uttered, Hail Mary, full of grace. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. The translation here has the angel saying, Greetings, O favored one. In the Latin Vulgate, translated by the church father Jerome, the words are gratia plena, which literally mean full of grace. The angel recognized that Mary had received such an abundance of grace that no woman before this moment in history had experienced. Her favor with the Lord was without equal. And so, with this greeting, Mary was stunned and bewildered. She must have thought, what can this possibly mean? Who is this angel? What does he mean to say? That I'm filled with grace? That I'm fa highly favored? And that I'm supposedly supremely blessed and that the Lord is with me? End quote. This isn't someone, if we stop and think, right, we need to analyze, analyze and take into account the, the details. This isn't someone who said, oh, well, finally. I have been awaiting in my perpetual righteousness, my perfect spotlessness, my ability to be co-mediatrix for you to arrive and Proclaim for the sake of the plebes that are going to read this later on who I am. Not at all. This is a young woman who clearly, and, and again, we, we have to remember the, the phraseology that we have. She, she is stunned. She is surprised. Or as Luke puts it, and we have it in the ESV, she was greatly troubled. Is this the reaction that someone, as the Roman Catholic Church tries to hold up, is basically a goddess would have absolutely not it is the same phraseology the same kind of wording as Zechariah's both of them were greatly troubled they were absolutely shocked there was nothing in what is explicitly described here to let us think of any kind of well I expected this no it's just an absolute shock what does this even mean how, how is he saying that I am, I am full of grace, I favored one, and that the Lord is with me? Again, thinking of that gracia plena, the, the full of grace, the favor of the Lord demonstrating in the grace of God, we, we have to dial back a little bit, get out of speaking Christianese, and remember that grace defined biblically as the undeserved or unmerited gift of God. The favor of God is unmerited. It is undeserved. There is nothing that anyone can do to earn the favor of God. The scriptures say this clearly. He is the sovereign ruler over all. There is nothing we can present to him that does not belong to him, even our own lives. Grace, favor from God is a peculiar demonstration of God's affection given by God's own free will to an undeserving human being. This is an important distinction for you to bear in mind as we navigate the passage because, as we've just talked about, as Dr. Sproul mentioned, the Roman Catholic world believes that Mary is the source of grace. Hence why they pray to her who is, quote-unquote, full of grace. She's not the source of grace. The, the biblical reality is that Mary, just like every other Christian, is the recipient of of God's grace. Likewise, the favor that Mary had found to be chosen from amongst the women of Israel to bear the Son of God was an unmerited kindness 
from God, a divine dispensation of undeserved grace. We've spoken in other messages, Advent series, about the fact that Christians shouldn't shy away from this reality. This is a peculiar and amazing, a wondrous grace given to Mary, a favor bestowed upon Mary. And no Christian should shy away from that. What Christians should bear in mind is that she is not the source of grace. She is not the fount of favor before God, but rather the recipient of it. This grace is the very same type of grace that Paul speaks of in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, where Paul says, In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. And here's the emphasis. According to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the Beloved. It is an undeserved grace. It is not something that is merited. It is a God-given reality. As always, grace is not contingent upon the deserving or undeserving nature of the recipient. As a matter of fact, we as Christians are, are well aware of that fact. The fact that grace, the grace that we've received is wholly undeserved. It is an unmerited grace. It is an efficacious grace. This is not a grace that is powerless. This is not a favor that is just simply, oh, well, I favor pineapple pizza over non-pineapple pizza, right? Or I favor peanut butter and strawberry jelly over peanut butter and grape jelly, or I favor sourdough over non-sourdough. That we, we, we lose so much in the language. Anything that God does is to the nth degree significantly higher. It's the reason why when we talk about the grace of God, we are speaking about something that is efficacious. It's the reason why in our hymn we sing marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured. There where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Second verse. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is coming a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Three marvelous, infinite, matchless Grace freely bestowed on all who believe, all who are longing to see his face. Will you this moment his grace receive? And in the middle of every one of those verses, what do we sing? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. There is no room for any kind of, well, it could save, or it could be greater than all of our sin, might be greater than all of our sin. No, this is a reality that is demonstrated in Scripture. It is an efficacious truth. Luke gives us the proper context in which we can understand the interactions between Gabriel and Mary. Mary, who didn't expect that due to her own righteousness, she deserved any kind of peculiar grace from God. She didn't go, ah, yes, I deserve this. I'm glad you're here to finally recognize this. Talking to me as a first person for over 400 years. No. There's no place for that. She wouldn't have claimed that she was a fount of grace. Many, many times we hear Theologians like Dr. White say if such and such a person from history heard what people are saying now or either they'd roll in their graves or they'd have something to say about that. It's the same here. There is no way in which Mary would have said, yeah, 
What you're saying about me and how you're representing me is correct. There's no place to find a young woman here who thought of herself as someone who could be a comediatrix between God and man. Rather, what we see is a humble, righteous, but very thoroughly confused and dumbfounded youth. Absolutely troubled by the fact that there is an angelic greeting that carries such importance and such implications. We've talked about the fact this is not an airheaded young lady. She would have understood some of these implications. It wouldn't have been, well, what does it mean that the Lord is with me? She would have thought of the other places in the scriptures where such phraseology is there. The Lord is with you, where the words that were given to Joshua, do not be afraid. Why are you not going to be afraid? What is the reason you can go into battle? What is the reason you are going to have victory? Because the Lord is with you. And these words are presented to her. She would have thought, what exactly? What wondrous thing? What incredible event? What exactly is about to happen? That's the reason why Luke says that she was greatly troubled at the saying. And she tried to discern, discern what sort of greeting this might be. What could the Lord have for me? These words are not common words. These words are not spoken to everyone. Everything that I know of from the scriptures, and we know that Mary knew a fair bit, tells me that these words are not to be taken lightly. And thinking back to that speculation of her thoughts that Dr. Sproul had when he said, she must have thought, what can this possibly mean? Who's this angel? What does he say? That I'm filled with grace? That I'm highly favored? That I am supposedly supremely blessed and that the Lord is with me? And of course, underlining all of this would have been, how? What, what, is, what is going to be asked of me? Confusion was evident. The bewilderment and the amazement are evident. Even without Dr. Sproul's words. We still see the very same fear and the acknowledgement of what happens when a sinful human being is confronted with the holiness of God. The same words, and again, this is an important detail. First, noting the reality that she was greatly troubled by what was being told to her. She didn't come and say, well, I expected this. In like manner, in the same way that we see, right? Sinful person, sees angelic creature, falls on face, great fear, or even in what Pastor Aaron was talking about this last Wednesday and the Wednesdays before, talking about Isaiah as one of the supreme examples of this reality and saying, Woe to me, for I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in a nation of men who have unclean lips. That recognition of I am a sinner before something holy is the very same thing that is followed here. Do not be afraid, Mary, verse 30, for you have found favor with God. It's the very same reaction. There, there was no expectedness, no facade of holiness it's the same reaction that every single human being has. But notice the fact that twice over. First time is the presentation of the reality that Mary is favored by the Lord. And the second time there is the reiteration. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. God has chosen to bestow His favor and grace upon you. As we covered with the interaction between Gabriel and Zechariah. And the message that Gabriel brings is truth from the God of truth himself. To Zechariah, the response was the fact that he stands in the presence of God and that, therefore, the message that he brings carries that weight, that authority, that veracity. Luke records this so that you may have certainty concerning what you've been taught. 
So one of the benefits that Theophilus and every reader of Luke after him has is the certainty of Gabriel's words carrying over from the interaction with Zechariah to the interaction with Mary. Gabriel stands in the presence of God. He has been sent with this message of truth to both. And it has the same authority, the same veracity, and the same weight. When Gabriel told Zechariah, this is what is happening, you will have a child, and his response is, but I'm old. The angel's response was, I stand in the presence of God. What I speak is truth from the God of truth. In like manner, the interaction with Mary, you are favored. I have no idea how this can be. What does he mean by favored? What, 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 how exactly is the Lord is with me? What, in my own self-analysis, makes it to where I could be the recipient of this fact? And it's the same truth being heralded again. I stand before the presence of God and what I have told you stands. You have favor from the Lord. This is a truth, an undeniable truth. And then Luke goes on by saying that Gabriel tells Mary, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. He, uh, finishing off, he says, You have found favor. And God's favor and grace bestowed. Up. Think about this connection. God's favor and God's grace. And then the explanation. Okay. What is this favor? What is this grace? How is the Lord with me? You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Now we talked about the, the latter part, where God himself chooses to name someone. When he chooses to name the child, and how important that is. How and what weight it carries when God himself names a child. So, we already know that that has its own level of importance. But stop and consider for a moment, as, as I talked about, because I want to make sure we're connecting the dots. There's a lot of information between now and 20 minutes ago. We spoke of seeing how it is that marriage being held the way that Mary held it, betrothal being held the way that it was held, and we've spoken of how children are held completely differently, right? Now let's connect that with how the favor of God is demonstrated in the words, and you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. The contrast between a biblically-minded society and the modern Western society could not be further contrasted than by coming to this verse and seeing the value the Word of God places on this truth. The favor of God being demonstrated to this young woman and her being able to conceive this child. We know what modern people think of children. The fruit of that is evident. But think of what the Word of God says. The Word of God says in Psalm 127, verse 3. Psalm 127, verse 3, 4, and 5. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's use. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies at the gate. Or Proverbs 17, verse 6. Proverbs 17, verse 6. Grandchildren are the crown of the aged, and the glory of children is their fathers. And of course, there are many other passages in both the Old and the New Testament that speak about the, the and talk about the proper raising of these children and these blessings that God bestows upon his people in the love and the instruction of his word. But 
take that, take what the Word of God says, and see the vileness that has permeated evangelical churches. Compare it. Compare the words eh, that children are a heritage from the Lord to the perverse, modern, and ungodly view of children that is propagated by the culture of death. The view that says that children are a hindrance. The view that says children are a stumbling, pl- a stumbling block in the path of your personal success. Think of how much you could climb in the career ladder if you didn't have a child. Think of how much you could have gone in your education if you didn't have a child. Think of how many other places you could go visit in the world if you didn't have a child. Or thinking about how the modern and perverse view of children is that of a commodity to be purchased by the elite where they can pick and choose the most genetically ideal child and then discard the rest as if they were rubbish. The contrast could not be further removed from one another. When modern Christians read this section of Scripture, their indoctrinated minds read a completely different thing. They, they read this verse, and because of this perverse and ungodly ideology from this world, they read of a young woman being told she will conceive a child. doesn't matter that it's miraculous or not, and their minds completely and instantly either misunderstand or fail to see the wondrousness in this passage at best. Or at worst, they malign it. They malign God's word and reproach the passage because it encroaches on the idol of human autonomy. A God-centered mind would see the having of children as the word of God describes it, as the blessing and glory it is for parents, all the more when considering that this specific case of a child being conceived is a fulfillment of promises made long ago, promises of a Messiah, promises of a king, and promises of a kingdom that would endure forever, and the implications that that would have for God's elect. But how many Christians... I am not talking about the world. How many Christians read this section, need I really say, what some of the absolutely abhorrent views of God are pertaining to this, pertaining to the Spirit of God overshadowing Mary, and what that has been called by those that claim to be Christians, They call it rape. They absolutely blaspheme because they do not understand what is being said here. Because when they read this, they don't properly think of children the way the Word of God describes them. Because they have been told over and over and over again since the late 50s that there are too many people in this world and we don't need more. It doesn't matter that nations around the world in God's judgment are now no longer able to produce enough children to continue as a nation. It would be one thing if we were talking about the worldly people, but Christians read this and their idols affected. The idol of human autonomy, the idol of my body, my choice, that has permeated the church comes and they are unable, they are blinded, they are veiled against seeing just how incredible an event this is. And again, so that we can connect everything together, we we must see how a proper view of betrothal, a proper view of marriage, a proper view of the sanctity of a husband and a wife, a 
betrothed man and a betrothed woman together has an absolute impact when they come together. And how that ties in to how they will view children, how they will view as Zechariah and Elizabeth did, the affliction of not being able to have a child for decades on decades on decades. All of that is impactful. It is an absolute perversity. We spoke a couple weeks ago about how it, it is wrong for Christians to say, oh, you've been blessed with singleness. You have been blessed with childlessness when the fact is both singleness and childlessness are an affliction. But it is an absolute, almost abomination for those that claim to be Christ's people, for those who claim to be God's people, to come together and wed and celebrate what God has said. What God's word demonstrates is an affliction. Celebrate childlessness because they are indoctrinated this way. And this is what Gabriel means when he says to Mary that the son she would conceive will be great, will be called the son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. This is the fulfillment of promises made long ago. We here, this small group of people, can understand more clearly just how horrendous, how absolutely heretical, how abominable it is to lay that type of charge against God when we understand the fulfillment of promises made long ago and the miracle that is to happen. The promises of the Messiah that David sang about, inspired by the Holy Spirit in Psalm 2. In Psalm 2, verses 7 through 9, or 6 through 9. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son today. I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. It is a fact we can't ignore promises being fulfilled that this is the king that would come, the one who would rule the begotten, the only begotten, the son that God promised would come through the prophet Samuel to David later on in 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 14. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And when he commits, and now we know we're talking about Solomon here, and when he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the Son of Men. Unlike John the Baptist, there is a very clear difference in the greatness that is being declared here pertaining to each child respectively. When Gabriel declared that John would be great before God, whereas Jesus is declared to be great, period. Great in the truest great in the highest sense. He is the long-awaited king. He is the king of kings. The promised righteous one whose kingdom endures forever. He is the mighty and powerful king who will dash all of his enemies with a rod of iron and shatter them like so much pottery. He is, as Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7, the child who would be born the son that would be given, the one whose government shall be upon his shoulders and whose name will be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of whose increase and his government 
and peace there would be no end. And Gabriel tells Mary, this is the son that she would conceive and give birth to. This is the favor bestowed upon her, the grace of God demonstrated to her. And again, let's take it all together. Let's put the entirety of the context together and come to see the questions, how, what grace, what is happening, come full circle when we see that grace, that favor, is demonstrated in the fact that of all the young women of Israel, all of the faithful young Israelite women, God chose her. God chose her to be the one through whom the long-awaited Messiah would come. The one through whom there would be hope and peace eternally. It is something that sincerely is beyond our comprehension. Simply because we don't have the same circumstances. Christ has come. We await his second coming. But this was the moment in space and in time when the promises would be brought forth to Zechariah. Gabriel spoke saying, your son is going to be the forerunner. He's the one that will come in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. And that set the stage. That salvation is coming. The, the promises to come are coming. And Gabriel visits Mary and says, through you. A son will be born. The king of kings. The wonderful counselor. Now you want to talk about dropping a bomb on someone's mind. That's it. It's, it's the reason why Mary responds with a question, how will this be since I am a virgin? You will conceive. And her question is, how will this be since I am a virgin? Is this supposed to happen through the normal means? Am I to go to my betrothed and say that an angel has arrived and I'm to have us wed and consummate? Of course, we know the answer. It would not be through natural means. But again, we consider the fact, the reality of the virginity of Mary. And it's where we're going to pick up next week with that same question, with the thoughts of considering, well, what in what spirit, in what sense was this question asked? And what does the answer reveal to us? We close with the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And all of God's people said, Amen. <laughs>